no, Fatal Giza uh, Puzzle. I don't know if you are here. Uh, Emilia, I think she's around. Um, Charles, Charles will be presenting remotely. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Carlos. Rubin, Atala, Zina, Jun, Jun Parel, and Stephen Donko will be presenting remotely. Uh, Mamadou will also be presenting remotely. Uh, Imram Ahmed. So we'll also be presenting remotely. And then we have a quick entry, um, also remote uh, speaker. So if you are a speaker and you are here, can you please uh, come on stage? Uh, we are going to be begin exactly at uh, 2.35. So we have some few more minutes. And uh, I'll take this opportunity to ask those sitting behind to please come forward so that we'll have a very good uh, coverage. And then um, this session, we are going to have uh, two remote, uh, two moderators. Uh, the first one in the person of uh, Salah. Salah, if you are there, please come on stage. And uh, we are also expecting Rebecca as a second moderator for this session. We are going to be looking at uh, different aspects of this important topic that we are going to be discussing. Rebecca, can you please come on stage? We need more chat. Yes. Carlos? Yeah. Yes. I think we'll need one more chair. Okay. Yeah, Sam George. Yeah, Sam George. Yeah. 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 Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's our privilege and pleasure to welcome each of you to this uh, pre-53 Day Zero event here in Berlin. Hope you all had a great lunch, yes? Fantastic. Now, if you seated right at the back, and uh, we would really like to ask you, even though you have freedom of choice, to actually come up to the front. The reason for this is there'll be an opportunity at some point during um, the session, the workshop, where we would like to hear from you as well. So what really would, we would like to uh, see happening is to have the panelists who are seated before you and some who have yet to join us, who are still remotely um, logging in, 
and uh, some who are still in, uh, tied up in other sessions who are just making their way here shortly. What, they, what we intend to do is to have them stimulate the discussion because this is a global uh, issue that uh, uh, paints to the heart of uh, the very core of development and economic development. And um, yes, yeah, stimulate uh, engaging conversations because we would also like to hear your stories. So with that, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Salanieta Tamanika Wemero and it's a privilege to be uh, one of the co-moderators tonight, this afternoon, tonight in some part of the Asia Pacific. <laughs> right, and so, uh, but before we do that, let me just uh, please first set the context. So Wisdom Donkor, whom you see here, has been advocating for the past two years to get this particular session afoot in the Internet Governance Forum. And you'll see Mary Uduma there, and a few other MEG members who can attest. So it's been really difficult to get uh, this session uh, to come, you know, to come to fruition. So the fact that it's being rolled out here in uh, Berlin at an IGF at a day zero event, it's uh, kudos to um, Wisdom. So please give him a big hand. He's a fearless advocate. Now with that, to set the context, I won't uh, bore you with the details because I'm sure before you signed up to come to this uh, uh, today's session, you would have read the session brief and there are a few, a few core public policy questions that we've highlighted for the panelists to address. Now because of the nature of the diversity of the panel, both geographically of you know time zones and also the constraints of time, what we've done is we've categorized the panelists to speak only on uh, uh, different topics. For example, the community network specialists will touch on community networks. There'll be uh, two panelists who will touch on innovation and the others will touch on electrification. But what we really want to do is to bring out the human side uh, of the problem, to humanize it. Because it's one thing to see empirical figures and statistics, quite another thing to actually hear the human experience that comes from the diverse cultural voices that are seated before you, and not just seated before you, that are amongst us in the room. And as we all know in the IGF, it is a two-way conversation, yes? So can I, can I get a yes to say that we're all going to engage? <laughs> it's not just panel down, but it's everyone together, yes? So I want you to be bold, come up, take the mic. If you want to make a comment, please just, as people are speaking, just start making your way form a queue. Does that make sense? We've got mics. And with that, please, I would like to call the Honorable Samuel George MP, if he could please uh, come up. He will be representing uh, uh, Ghana. He will speak to the government issues. And uh, I'm going to ask um, the lovely Rebecca Crosby, Managing Director of Credo Global, uh, to uh, introduce the panelists. Aside from the regular panelists that she has, that you've seen on the poster, we have a few surprise guests from government. I got the list right here from Ms. Crosby, Mrs. Crosby, and she'll read them out. And again, welcome everybody. <clears throat> okay, so we are, I think we've got a real treat for you. We've got a real cacophony of uh, value in this room today. As Sala's already said, not just on the stage, but amongst you too. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Um, so, obviously, we've got Wisdom Donkar there, um, who is the President and CEO of African Open Data and Internet Research Foundation. Um, we've also got, um, remotely, Robin Atala, who is based in Egypt. Um, we've got, in the middle there, Amelia Kamanalagi Muriel. I hope I said that right. Okay, great. Um, she will be representing the Pacifica Nexus Think Tank, but is based out of France at the moment. Um, also, uh, we have June Parry, um, who's out of Barbados, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing what she's got to say. Um, also remotely, we've got Charles Nolan, who is the former Vice President of Qatar Airways. Um, he's based out of Qatar. Um, also, uh, Imani Liu, who is the CEO and founder of uh, Marconet out of New Zealand. Uh, Zina Buhab, um, who's out of Lebanon, welcome. Um, uh, Kwaku Antwi, who is out of Ghana. Um, we have Dr. Carlos Ray Ramo, uh, sorry, 
Moreno, did I pronounce that right? Sorry. Um, who's out of South Africa, welcome. Um, remotely too, we have um, Imran Ahmed Shah, who's out of Pakistan. Um, we also have today Stephen Mawutu Donka, um, out of Ghana. Um, we have Innes um, from Tunisia. I'm, have you noticed I didn't even pretend to pronounce the surname, sorry. And uh, we also have uh, Mamadoulou out of Senegal. So as you can see, we've got a, a whole variety here with us today. Um, I would also like to say that remotely we have, uh, uh, sorry, with us, we have the Honourable Samuel George MP from Ghana, as we've already introduced, um, and also Wagha Sazhan from Pakistan, and Jackson Malaki, uh, who is the officer of the Prime Minister in Vanuatu. So uh, welcome. Uh, please be, uh, feel free, like we've already said, to ask your questions, and we will facilitate and guide you into that later. Thank you. Okay, so where we want to start today is, like we've said, we have, we're going to split this into three issues. Um, and we'd like to start really talking about community network. Um, so what we understand is, is that uh, when, you, when you deal with issues and systems, when you deal with electricity, in, as in, is in this case, you know that not far away from a system are people. And where people are, there are issues. Um, so universal access to electricity is essential in solving so many of our development challenges that we face today. And uh, when we can get that right, we can see a much broader um, shift occur. Um, so we know that uh, communities get, become affected, um, where social norms are changed, uh, where there is a creation of inequality and division, where there's pressure put on people to rely on human collaboration rather than unreliable systems at times. And you're going to hear some really personal stories today um, from people who have not just been affected by an issue that we maybe read about or we hear in the media, um, but when you know what it's like, when you live uh, or you touch something in the reality of that, it gives a very different perspective. So um, we want to start by looking at the community um, networks. We want to look at the human impact. Um, and so with that in mind, um, I would like to invite Carlos, please, to come and share with us. Hi everyone, thank you for coming and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this, in this panel. Uh, I'm going to try to bring the human element somehow, but I was going to focus as well more on the public policy issues. Uh, so I, I'll try. So at the end of the day, I guess the first question is what are community networks, right? And, uh, and some of you may know, but uh, basically is people who are affected in this case by lack of connectivity or by unaffordable connectivity or by lack of uh, the content that they would like to, to access in the internet, that they get together and set up their telecommunications infrastructure and they deploy it and they manage it in a way that uh, it solves the issues that they have, right? Um, in that sense, what are the most critical gaps hindering the, 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 the actual deployment or the actual uh, uh, growth of community networks? There are, there are plenty every year. There are, there are more, but uh, there is still a big, uh, a big issue in the, in the telecommunications industry around the rights and around the, the, the skills and the capacity for uh, communities or collectives to set up and deploy their own telecommunications infrastructure. If you ask many people in this room, if you ask many people at the IGF, they will say that only big national or multinational telecommunications operators are able to set up that type of infrastructure, maintain it, govern it, and operate it. Uh, but we are having proof, as I say, day by day, that uh, many collectives around the world, particularly in the Global South, are getting themselves together and, 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 and setting up this, this type of infrastructure. So by, 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 by getting more people to know about this, by having more recognition on the topic, uh, there, are, there, are, there is more, more space for this movement to grow. Uh, and what governments can do? What are the main public policy issues about this? Well, I believe the first one is recognition. I believe the first one is about 
uh, governments and uh, uh, including in their in their broadband policies including in their national development plans the role that community networks can play in uh, addressing the digital divide in addressing the issues that the multinational companies are not able to address in those remote communities that you were describing in your introduction. And with that recognition, many other, key, many other th things come, right? Like for instance, in South Africa and Kenya, community networks are included in the, in the, in the broadband plan as a type of institutions that could uh, address the, the digital divide. And with that, for instance, in South Africa now, there is an SMME policy that includes the role that the small operators and cooperatives that could be community networks could play on doing this. The same was, goes with licensing. There has been a recent uh, uh, inclusion in the, in the Ugandan licensing framework for community-owned community, community -owned networks, the same with Spectrum, that I think is the next frontier. So far, everything that we've seen is in Wi-Fi. There are new Spectrum, in particular, international mobile telephony, 2G, 3G, 4G, that communities could also use to set up their, their, their community networks. And, and this is, as well as, fu as funding, there are more and more governments, including this in their universal service funds, uh, etc. And issues like capacity building as well. I think governments can do a lot, but it starts with recognitions that new actors and stakeholders are necessary. And it's not me or my organization talking about this. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, the, the, the Specialized Technical Committee from the African Union in their declaration from the Samuel Sheik uh, meeting uh, directed the African Union to promote community networks in the continent. So. There is more of this coming. It's not only, again, uh, activists and researchers, but it's also policy at the highest level that is asking to promote these type of models. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Carlos. Well, Carlos was speaking on uh, community networks and setting the context. We have uh, Mr. Emani Lui, who's currently streaming and zooming in all the way from New Zealand. So it's probably 2 a.m. in the morning for him. So with that good morning, uh, Emani, we look forward to hearing from you. So whilst uh, that's uh, coming up, Emani again is uh, head of a startup telco in uh, New Zealand, Makanet. And he uh, has extensive experience in running internet service providers and rolling out community networks in uh, small scale uh, small-scale community solutions within the Pacific. Do we have him, Wisdom? Thank you. So whilst that's uh, happening, if we could get the next, uh, who's the next one back? Um, okay, so we're ready for Imani. Whilst well, we're uh, waiting, who's okay. the next one? Um, then we have Imran. Imran is remote as well. Uh, either Imran or Emani available? While we're waiting, if we could play Mamadou's uh, video from Senegal. Right, as with all things, technology is not always reliable. <laughs> from time to time, we have hiccups, as you can see. But whilst that's happening, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Mamadou, who we've introduced, who's going to remotely log in. Right, just before you press the play button, hang on, Wisdom just before you press the play button. Now, Senegal is one country. Uh, if you remember, there was an ICANN meeting in Senegal several years ago. And remember seeing a lot of uh, child labor and, and poverty in the streets. Now, one of the challenges that Senegal faces is, whilst they have the capacity to grow their own food, they don't have the capacity to have their own reliable energy grids. And because of that, they can't store food. So they've got to import food from Brussels. Again, further, uh, you know, um, keeping them in, in poverty and that sort of thing. And so the correlation between internet and community networks. So Mamadou is from Senegal. He's the head of IT in the Agricultural Bank. And so it's a privilege to have him um, share his video tonight. So yes, thank you, Wisdom. Hit play. Inclusion and community networks. Uh, now in the Agricultural Bank of Local Group. I'm working right now in the Agricultural Bank of Senegal as communication officer. I'm a main member and I can serve coach. I'm also a supporter of the uh, internet governance VP3. I'm very, very, very glad to join, join this panel today. 
panel talking about uh, electricity, digital inclusion, and also network. Uh, this topic is for me a very hot topic, as you know. Well, from the global south, uh, the communities have experienced issues, uh, issues on electricity distribution, on digital inclusion, and some stuff like that relating to electricity, electricity availability in, 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 in all that region. Take, uh, talking uh, about the Senegalese case, which is not very far from cases we have encountered in the global south in, in other countries. The Senegalese case is likely very similar to, 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 to the case in all Africa. Uh, as for that, uh, you can say that Senegal has experienced a lot of, lot of tough moments, tough period in uh, internet distribution. Above all, is the period between, uh, between, between 2008 and 2012, where we had a lot of, lot of cuts, a lot of, lot of problems of uh, Ethnic distribution in the rural areas above all, and in some in, 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 in some urban areas. But we noticed a progression beginning in 2012 with some police state with the introduction of the solar power, the introduction of uh, wind power. Uh, we noticed a real progression in the in the electricity distribution. In the, in, the, in the country impacting the, the internet penetration. In that period, that we noticed a progression of 16% between 2012 and 2000, 2017 in the electricity distribution in the country, which has impacted the internet penetration passing to, from 2012 to 24% to reach in 2017, 40%. In the above all in the rural, in, in the whole country, uh, but what we can notice is that more has to be done to 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 to, to, to achieve the goal of this inclusion, to achieve the goal of electricity distribution, which can impact the internet, the, the, the internet penetration rate, which is around in all the country six to two point nine percent. Yes, I think that Senegal has done a lot. In the internet distribution, which has uh, in electricity distribution, which has impacted the internet distribution, and uh, as I said earlier, more has to be done to reach our goal. It is what I would like to share with you, waiting for our reply, for your replies and and, and, and some questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mamadou. So, do we have a money? He's just sent me a message to say he's online on the Zoom. Um, Emani, could you please unmute yourself? <laughs> He's sending me a message saying, I can hear myself. Yeah, unmute yourself, uh, Emani. So while that's on, if you have burning questions or burning comments, just make a note, because there'll be time for global interaction. So while that's happening, we'll just get Inez to come and speak for three minutes on community networks in uh, Tunisia. As you can see, we're short of seats, but that's okay, we improvise. Right. So whilst Inez is coming, welcome Inez. Inez is from Tunisia. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ines Hafaib. I am a teacher from Tunisia. I work for the Ministry of Education. Um, so today I would like to tell you about um, digital inclusion actually. Um, so um, with my colleagues uh, since like five years, we've been working on uh, integrating technologies in education, especially to, uh, to reach out to the more um, like, for example, for the handicapped uh, students that we have uh, those who uh, study at uh, uh, remote countryside areas. So what we first started was uh, starting to inculcate and to train our colleagues, teaching colleagues, on creating what we call creating a learning generation. Um, 
So this came from the idea that um, education um, by 2050, education has to change. Uh, because by 2050, uh, half of today's jobs will be replaced by technology. New jobs will demand different and higher level skills. And since I am from Africa, the population of Africa will double to 2 billion. Half will be young people. So this is uh, why we are targeting young people through education. And unless education systems uh, can respond to these changes by 2050, we will have a major shortage of skilled workers uh, that will stunt the global economy. And up to a quarter of the population could still live in extreme poverty. And this also will create more income inequality. Um, and in a context as fragile and sensitive as in Africa, some African countries, the, uh, this could create an increased conflict and instability. So, um, if we go to the facts that we have today, up to half of today's jobs, around 2 billion, are at high risk of disappearing due to automation. And new technologies, if our, us as teachers, we don't adapt to these changes, new technologies risk not creating new jobs at anything like the scale, they are eradicating them. Um, also, uh, we need, as teachers, we need to teach high-level skills. And um, those with high skills, capacity to adapt to change, and ability to access uh, technology will expect an even greater share of earnings. Um, so what are our expectations right now? Uh, we will work on a priority will be given to children at risk. Um, what, who are the children at risk? How do we categorize them in terms of digital, digital inclusion? Um, what we call children at risk are the rural child. Uh, personally, I teach at uh, a remote countryside area. The street child that we don't think much about. The refugee child uh, and the child who is disabled or visually impaired. And uh, what we need to do is providing resources and willingness, uh, especially government willingness to harness new technologies to meet their needs, and urging a commitment from policy and decision makers to every child. Um, and right now, uh, we have like a national um, strategy of providing common training for teachers um, to teach 21st century skills, and uh, our project is also to create indexes um, and indicators to assess overall quality and edu of educational institutions. So um, I, will not, I don't have much time. I don't want to take from my uh, colleagues' time, but I will just uh, share with you a figure. Um, so this figure is, uh, has to do with educating girls. So educating girls uh, saved over one 130 million lives declines in mortality rates. Um, so educating girls has, to, uh, has a, a direct impact on the decline of a true, uh, sorry, uh, in the decline of mortality rates. Education also is the smartest investment. For each one dollar invested in an ad additional year of schooling, we have, in lower in low income, we have um, earnings and health benefits are $10. You might ask, what is $10? Well, in Africa, $10 is, is uh, a good amount of money. Um, yes, so just one to conclude. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so I will just, um, like, uh, I will just end with uh, the 2016 um, UNESCO Global Education Monitoring Report. Education is vital for achieving the sustainable development goals of poverty reduction, hunger, eradication, improved health, gender equality, and empowerment, sustainable agriculture, and resilient cities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Inez, for raising a very important points on digital inclusion. If we could just get Emani back online. He's ready. Okay. 
Okay. Slight change, the change of plans. Imran Ahmed Shah, President of the Urdu Internet Society and convener of the Pakistan IGF is online. So we welcome you, Imran. Please go ahead. Uh, I think that uh, there is some uh, confusion with the uh, uh, sound from uh, Imani, who he was speaking, uh, but uh, uh, the floor could not uh, listen. But we were listening him through the uh, remote session. Anyhow, uh, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Imran Amasha, and I belong to Internet Governance Forum of Pakistan. We have uh, uh, done a lot of uh, projects uh, in Pakistan for the uh, community networks. For example, we, uh, our uh, partners and friends started from uh, uh, e-village community center and the telecenter in the rural areas and remote uh, areas of the Pakistan and uh, spread it in uh, the different uh, uh, provinces and uh, uh, different rural areas and uh, uh, to the council levels. Now, I would like to uh, discuss about the electrification issues to uh, achieve the goal for uh, providing the internet facility to the uh, rest of the people who are still not connected to the internet. In order to, in order to address the policies of digital inclusion, the community networks, we have to focus on unserved communities and the reasons behind the regional division. One of the major region, major reason is the main focus of the investment for the development and improvement of the infrastructure in the most populated areas, or we can say the urban areas, from where they have good return of the investment. We need the immediate change in the policies at the government level and at the private level, private sector. That one who is investing in the populated areas should have to invest at least 10 to 20 percent of their investment in the unpopulated areas to facilitate them, to facilitate the unserved communities with the electrification with the communication infrastructure and the internet. We recommend that there should be a policy for national, uh, at national levels by the parliamentarians and by the legislatures that while investing in the most popular areas, they should invest at least 10 to 15 percent in rural areas and remote areas as well as their annual revenue should go to the rural areas and remote areas to provide what kinds of the facility they can do in their own uh, uh, multi-stroke holder uh, expertise or the opportunity. To provide them the facility of IC. And third recommendation is the partnership with the NGOs government and private sector should support the NGOs who are helping bringing digital aid to the rest of the world. We highly appreciate the contribution of innovation such as broadband, 4G, 5G and the projects like Google Looms in the same context. We recommend the implementation of solar trees and further innovation and innovative ideas, the implementation of I innovative ideas like solar powered earth station packed with the satellite internet to facilitate long range of distributed internet through Wi Fi in the backward areas where we don't have the electrification and the same units. Either these are the smart solar trees, Wi-Fi trees, or these are the small units of like uh, telecenters or community centers. 
they should have night nights or lamps for the studies for the students who can study at the night. These are the things which I can recommend at this stage and we can become the partner of the NGOs and government and private sectors to expand the internet penetration in not only in the, our country but in neighbor countries and at the global level to facilitate the, those people, those communities which are still living without electrification. For example, in my country, 57 people are living without electricity. How we can provide them internet facility when we cannot port the internet towers, the communication towers at those locations? There, there are few innovative ideas has to be implemented to cover these areas. For example, Google Looms and the solar art stations with the Wi-Fi facility. Thank you. Thank you, Imran. Thank you, Imran, for streaming in all the way from uh, Pakistan. So uh, apologies, uh, people. As you can see, we're having technical difficulties. We're unable to get Emani on the Zoom, even though other people could hear him on the Zoom. Is, um, so the next thing we want to do is to really highlight uh, the second uh, component, which is the innovation component. Do you have, the, do you have uh, Zaina's uh, video? And if I could invite Zaina. So each of the speakers, because of the number of speakers we have, they've been allocated three minutes, so that afterwards we can have dialogue. So, well, so Zaina, please come. Hello everybody, my name is Zena Buharb. Uh, I'm the head of international cooperation at Ogero Telecom. Uh, Ogero Telecom is the incumbent operator in Lebanon. We are the executive arm of the Ministry of Telecommunication. And currently we are aligning our, our core uh, business strategies to accelerate progress in addressing the, the SDGs. And for this reason, uh, we are collaborating with the other stakeholders from the private sector, from universities, in order uh, to reach our vision of a digital future. Um, we are working on many uh, projects currently uh, to, in to promote innovation, but I will share with you some info regarding uh, the project called uh, the supercomputer or the high performance computing. Uh, this is uh, a project, we are currently working on finalizing uh, an agreement with the European Organization for Nuclear Research. CERN, located in Geneva, to implement this facility in partnership with the major universities in Lebanon, like the American University of Beirut, the Lebanese University, University St. Joseph. And this, is, this project is for pure uh, scientific and technological research for the benefit of the Lebanese uh, society in large. Uh, we will provide the location, we will provide the high-speed uh, internet connection, uh, installation and operation of, uh, of the system. Uh, when we say uh, high performance computing, it's about a modern notion and grouping a computational power to supply much higher performance that could, uh, than what could be uh, achieved from a typical uh, workstation or, uh, or PC. The objective of this project is to boost the cyber infrastructure in Lebanon and to build up the research capabilities for the Lebanese universities, mainly to retain the talented students and to encourage innovation in Lebanon. Uh, certainly, we will have the transfer uh, of, uh, of knowledge uh, from the Swiss uh, part also, from the Swiss uh, partners. Uh, 
Uh, this project will encourage uh, uh, R&D in Lebanon. Okay, thank you. Uh, it will provide unique it will provide unique opportunities to uh, the university students in Lebanon to attain high, uh, high hands-on experience at technical expertise from the Swiss partner. It will, it will encourage uh, science discoveries through the utilization of this supercomputer facility and innovations will, will, become, will uh, occur in Lebanon at uh, a faster rate uh, and it will bring maybe Lebanon clo closer to the developed uh, countries with, with regard to technical uh, gaps. Okay. The main disciplines that will be uh, uh, tackled with this project is the particle analysis, particle physics analysis, the oil and gas discovery, uh, the social sciences, computational biology, uh, automotive uh, design, and much, much more. Uh, hopefully, we will, we will uh, start this project, we will uh, put this project uh, uh, on the track uh, very soon, and we will start using these facilities by the first quarter of 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Zena. Zeno is speaking on innovation. Our other panelists who will be speaking on uh, innovation is from Qatar. Are we able to get him on uh, wisdom? So one of the reasons um, why we've picked like a diversity of streams is here you'll see different uh, countries and regions. When Amelia gets to speak, you'll see the Middle East, Pacific and African stats up, both the electrification rates and also the internet penetration rates. So one of the things that uh, Charles is going to highlight from Qatar is that you can have regions um, uh, and varied, of course, where you have 100% electrification rates and innovation and others, which you will hear from June, where you have the 100% electrification rates, but still challenges in terms of community networks. So are we able to get um, Charles Nolan from Qatar? If not, uh, Kwok from uh, Ghana, if he's online? So while, yes, so I'm going to call upon Amelia. And so while Amelia comes up to speak on the Pacific perspective, I'll just ask Wisdom to throw up the PowerPoint. Thank you. Three minutes, eh? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for coming. Um, as uh, you could see at the background, there will be a slide uh, showing the uh, electricity versus the um, internet penetration. And um, in the Pacific itself, there's a good number, a good percentage coverage in, in terms of uh, electricity. And the least countries is PNG, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu, with only 63%, that's the lowest uh, penetrations of internet uh, in the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. I guess I just want to share with you, uh, with Fiji, uh, being a 96% uh, penetration of electricity, there's still that little percent that still need to be um, recognized and identified and to be taken care of. Uh, personally, this, um, this is a personal uh, topic for me because I come from a very rural area, a remote uh, island, uh, the farthest largest island in Fiji. And when you grow up, you have all these resources with you that you are part of the community, you're part of the land. And you see this uh, internet being also a platform where you can reach out. But you are forced to urbanization because that's only where you can access electricity and Internet. I graduated um, from, uh, with uh, information system. So after I graduated, I wanted to go back home and do something to help the people, to connect with my people. But then with this, and still today, there's still a problem with internet connection. There's still a pro problem with electricity problem. Uh, just towards the end of last year, um, so as you could see that I also moved to France, but that 
It was only then that I could leave Fiji because I could connect with my family. We can actually face time. We can actually, <laughs> because Pacific people in general, we are cultured people as well, and we are community oriented. And I feel that the technology is moving so fast. The, the people who are covered, the people, and just keeps on going in that direction. And the, the, the people like us who are very remote with limited access are left behind. And I guess I want to voice that we want to be included and we want the, it's not just about equality, it's about providing equity that would allow us to utilize the resources that we have in land and to, to, to be in the trend that where everyone is going. And I guess with that, uh, because I've seen also there's a woman inclusion programs and so many other programs, the aiding programs that coming to the Pacific, which I could see that information technology could actually embed it into that. And I guess my, I want to leave with you is that with the, before we would say the land will provide, now with natural disaster coming in, that is not the change of weather. It's not reliable to sustain us anymore. And what are we going to do about it? How are we going to collaborate to make sure that no one is forgotten? Thank you. Amelia, I just wanted to say, um, I find that interesting, your fact that you could leave Fiji because you could communicate with them. Yeah? Yes. So, um, so uh, based on what you've just said on com com be your culture being community-minded and community-built, can you just give us quickly um, just some insight into that? What does it mean to be able to communicate with your family where you're on the other side of the world? Is that a deal breaker? Uh, yes, I guess uh, for mm. me personally, I come from a very close knitted family and to be able to connect and to live, the, the culture is different moving on this side and so forth. Um, it's, um, it's the people you could relate to or the struggle you face, you can connect with these people sharing the same. And um, it's basically, a, as you said, a deal breaker being able to connect right. with my family because they used to be in the, we moved to the urban, but then after the time and they went back to the rural area. Uh, I guess what I want to say is we work so we can have this vacation to go back to the sand beaches and enjoy this luxury. <laughs> we are the Pacific, we grew up with that. Yeah. That is our livelihood, that is us. So, yes, so mm -hmm. we just want to be connected. We don't want to be left behind. We have a lot to provide, yeah. but we need these connections. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. So issues of uh, globalization and migration jump to mind there. Interesting. Okay. So next up we have June. While June's making her way, the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization's Acting Secretary General just landed. So she's running a bit late. That's why we're waiting for the government panel. But please, June, take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm June Paris. I'm from a small island in the Caribbean called Barbados, um, which most of you will probably have heard about. Um, we cater to tourists and tourism and um, expats and Barbadians, of course, Bayesians, as you may know. Um, we have a pride in the country which sometimes I think can create problems because we're so proud. Um, in other words, we tend to think we're okay when we're not and we fall behind um, the developing countries. We also, because we're um, mostly British and we follow the, Brit the British, we tend to follow their guidelines and um, like the US as well which again, doesn't always fit into our space because we're a small island. We don't have a problem with rural development because we're not rural, we're mostly urban. It's a small island, 166 square miles, 290,000 people live on the island. Um, so what I want to say is we are pretty okay in terms of electricity. In fact, we've got an electricity rate of 100%, um, which is good for a developing country. Usually in the Caribbean, we don't have problems with electricity and water and things like that because we're so small, but we do have natural disasters and this can create some severe problems for the islands. With Barbados, we're lucky. We don't have that problem until the last two weeks. We had a serious problem of electricity outages, water outages over a period of three days. I had no electricity for two full days. So you know what that meant. 
Now, the problem is the electricity is provided privately, private sector, and the problem was the machinery is now out of date, the oil was contaminated, and um, yeah, severe, it caused severe breakdowns. Over two days, three days, people, there was loss of income, loss of job, well, people couldn't make money, lots of food had to be thrown away, um, we couldn't connect, for example, me, I couldn't connect to the internet to do any work. And the, the main problem was communication. It was not communicated properly. Yeah, we didn't know. If we knew, we could have prepared for it. Um, so, let me go on to connecting the next billion. Are we ready to connect to the next billion? What do you think? Are we? Because if we are not bringing our machinery up to date and we are not communicating properly and people can't connect properly, that is a problem, isn't it? Um, so, we, we know about the SDGs and SDG 7, which is um, all about connectivity and electricity and that sort of thing. Um, so I think we're getting ready for it, but we're not quite ready. We have a large UN presence in Barbados, and we've been looking at um, things like Small Island Future Fest and two days of um, inclusiveness where people get together to do things. And the, the government is also looking at next year, 2020, in connecting with um, people who live overseas with something called We Gathering to 2020. But if we're planning all this stuff, but if we're not connecting properly and the machinery is out of date and we can't connect to the internet, how is this all going to work out? Um, so what is, um, in my opinion, what's lacking is the ability to connect to all the citizens, not only through electricity and internet, but this, without electricity, there's a problem with the water. Without electricity, there's a problem with connecting, there's a problem with um, transportation, there's a problem with the health services. I mean, the big companies had, um, what do you call them, generators. So they didn't really lose too much. But what about the other small companies? Um, uh, loss of, lo people lost lots of money over three days. Um, so we have, we're trying to in implement policies, but I still think we need to work a bit more at getting this all done. So what I'm looking at, um, um, for the outcomes of this session is to look at how we can support developing countries and align to have clean energy and sources that would provide internet connections and electricity connections and everything that is good for the next, so that we connect, can get on to the next billion. Now, establishing community networks, I think that we also need to think not only of the internet, but other means of communication when things go wrong. When things go wrong, we need to be able to fix things quickly. Um, we can't say people, oh, check social media pages because you, we don't have electricity, we don't have internet, so how can we do that? Um, so messages can be confusing and it can create some sort of panic. Looking at the future and looking at what happened with us is this can create some serious mental health problems. Yeah, because um, you're not sure, you're not sure what's going to happen, you're not sure when it's going to happen. You're not sure what you should do. Should you stock up on lots of meat in your freezer? Should you, you know, should you just buy a little at a time? You know, should you cook lots of food or just a little bit of food? Because where are you going to put it if there's no electricity? Um, so we need to be more proactive um, in terms of looking at this goal. Um, so um, what I would say to wrap up is that we need alternative energy supplies for the future. Um, to decrease demand on fuel fossil. We need really good infrastructure. We also need basic planning, very basic planning, like what can we do when things go wrong, maintenance procedures, and educate, education, yeah? um, concrete policies, both for citizens and providers, um, and um, we need access to everyone, children, women, people with disabilities, and we also need to market services so that people understand exactly what they're buying into. Okay, I mean, we cannot control natural disasters, but we can plan and we can think outside the box. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, June. Now, before we go into the government section, I'm just going to ask Inez if she could sit uh, next to Zaina. 
And I'd like to ask uh, Mrs. Uh, Nisa Fortay-Pacel from the Commonwealth Telecommunic uh, Telecommunications Organizations to please join us. She's, she's just landed. Apologies if it's been very curt and brief, guys, with the panelists. It's just because of the nature of the time constraints. Now, before she initiates the discussions with government, and Rebecca will come and uh, uh, facilitate the interactions um, and sort of uh, synthesize it, uh, if there are any pressing comments from the floor, anyone? Anyone remotely streaming in that wants to make a comment? I believe Glenn McKnight sent a remark. Glenn McKnight from Canada, who's currently in a... Right, so basically what he said was he's happy to uh, showcase his... Uh, uh, they've deployed a community um, network solution, small scale, which is very cheap, cost effective. And Glenn is currently at an ISOC trustee meeting, but he's happy to share the case story in a very detailed case study, so if anyone wants to access that. And the information paper that's, uh, that's being uh, developed by all the panelists here, and there are many things they couldn't say, but they want to say, but will be in that information paper, is going to be broadly shared, and uh, input is going to be invited. For, uh. So with that, uh, Mrs. Uh, Purcell, if you'd like to uh, facilitate uh, the questions, you have a few government panelists and also a few government reps who may be in the room just to ask them what their take is on public policy based on what they've heard so far and what are some things that can be done. So you have roughly 10 minutes. And after that, I'd like to ask for Mrs. Uh, Rebecca Crosby to wrap the session up. Thank you. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, all of you have introduced yourselves, yes? Okay, well, my name is Nisa Fuatai Purcell. I'm the Acting Secretary General of the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organizations. And uh, as you know, um, the, the Commonwealth um, is a very unique group of countries because um, they span over four regions um, of the world and we, they, there's a mix of development issues uh, within this group with a population of 2.4 billion. That's roughly almost about a third of the uh, world's population. So it's the same issues that we will be, uh, uh, we, are, we are discussing here at IGF. But what is the issue? The main issue is access. So it doesn't matter what, we all try to do concerning um, digital um, inclusion when there's a lack of access, and that is the main reason, not just on ICT um, information and communication technologies, but also to electricity. Electrification is really, really important. So. Uh, let me go around uh, the, um, our panel here and, um, and ask you. Hey, hi. hi. <laughs> yes. Yes. So uh, let me start with my friend. Uh, it's so good to see you here, Honorable. Um, just, uh, um, just to see where you are at the moment. You know where I am. This is my passion. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, I believe that Ghana could be what you call a case study for how to deploy rural ICT and electricity. In 2004, so about 15 years ago, Ghana decided to pass legislation to set up a body called the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund for Electronic Communication. What we realized was that when you leave the decision to move communications into the hands of big business, it won't happen. So we passed legislation that took 1% of all the revenues from MNOs and put that in the hand of government and said government will drive rural telephony. And so what we've done is when a, when a telco makes a billion dollars a year, we take 1% of that, that's $10 million, and put that into rural telephony. And we, we've also had an opportunity for local businesses to bring up 
rural telephony solutions that sends 2G and 3G networks into these areas. And then you also have a contemporary program under the Energy Ministry that is called the Self-Help Electrification Program. So government provides the transformers, the communities come together, community-based, and contribute money to buy the, the electricity poles, and then they're able to connect electricity. So you realize that in Ghana today, you have almost 84% coverage of electricity and about 80% penetration of internet across the country. It may not look good for the developing world, but in Africa, that is a model. I certainly will come back to you. And uh, this is where universal access funds come in. And when there are issues, this is where governments step in. This is where governments um, see an issue and use the universal um, access funds, not just for operators, but also um, for electrification. And I'm really, really happy to say that according to the World Energy um, Outlook 2018, India had completed its electrification um, covering the whole of India. And uh, Ken yes, uh, in 2018. And then we look at Kenya, the case of Kenya. Um, for in 20, 20, 2001, it was 30% or something like that. But uh, in 2018, it's now reaching 85%. And this is uh, based on the uh, efforts of, of the government. And to balance the equation, bringing in small islands, um, my own country, Samoa, um, we reached 98% in 2014. So it's really, really good. But when it comes to ICTs, it's another story, but a lot of uh, case studies here, as you said, that um, we can look at. Um, if I may, no? Uh, uh, sorry. Um, My friend from Vanuatu. Thank you, Anisa, and good afternoon to you all. Uh, I'm Jackson from uh, the Vanuatu Internet Governance Forum. And um, I think this uh, topic is uh, uh, very relevant at the time uh, we are in, especially development around uh, ICTs and telecommunication. Uh, for start, um, when we talk about digital inclusion, it's uh, very broad. Uh, uh, it covers a lot of things, and um, uh, as uh, we always promote at the uh, Internet Governance Forum, uh, multi-stake uh, holder uh, approach is uh, very critical, not just in the ICT sector, but also uh, in other uh, utilities and services sectors, such as uh, electricity, uh, roads, for instance. Uh, we have communities uh, who didn't have uh, access to proper roads. Uh, now that the roads are uh, being done by government uh, through funding and uh, donor support, uh, we have uh, ISPs uh, pushing out their towers and infrastructure along those roads. Um, we have health uh, services also following. So um, when we look at uh, ICT and telecommunication as a whole, we uh, actually rely on all these other sectors. Uh, uh, they are something that adds value to ICT. Um, when people uh, have access to uh, agriculture information, they have access to health information, education, uh, then ISPs and uh, telecom companies actually see value in putting this uh, infrastructure at uh, remote areas and they also get uh, return on their investment. So uh, I think uh, from our view, uh, just for your information, Vanuatu has uh, 63 islands and uh, uh, that's a challenge. It's like uh, running 63 countries. They all have different cultures. Uh, some are flat, some are mountainous. So. Uh, Collaboration between all these sectors is important to see ICT uh, go through, and uh, then we can have uh, e-government services and all these um, apps that can uh, add value to the services that are being put up. Thank you very much. All right, um, as you've heard, uh, digital inclusion is uh, an exciting topic, but uh, as we all know, um, coverage, Access, it has to cover everybody. Can you consider this? A lot of farmers in way out in a rural um, 
Kenya or Ghana, I would say, they have a lot of crops or whatever they are doing culturally, but they have no idea that when they have access to the internet, they don't, they can't, they can market it locally as well as overseas. And that is a huge uh, economic impact when we do that. But uh, this is where I'm saying that um, with digital inclusion, there is a need for government intervention um, for universal access as an example, where the operators will pay in even 1% of their profits. That will provide a lot of money so that um, we can try and bridge the gap of where we are now. And then um, there's a lot of programs now that use artificial intelligence. And I think that's the core of the digital uh, economy is artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, I'm telling you now, without data, without data, there can be no AI. Yeah. Because AI is supposed to uh, mine the data so that we can get meaningful information. Yeah. The problem now is that there's too much data in there or lack of data. Without data, there can be no AI. So thank you so much. And uh, I agree with uh, Ghana and also Vanuatu. I'm so proud that, uh, yes, these government, two governments are moving ahead um, to ensure that there is digital inclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, let's just take a moment to summarize and then we're eager for your questions and input. Um, so please don't just put your hand up, let's just come and uh, form a queue in a minute and uh, we're very interested in what you have to ask and say. Okay, um, I'm actually married to a, uh, a mixed-race South African and um, one of the pains that I have of being married to a mixed-race South African is that he's always cold. And so when we are in bed at night, it's always the case that he's wrapped up like a sausage roll and I have no duvet. And uh, he'll wake up in the morning and say, I've had the most amazing night's sleep. It's so lovely and warm, isn't it? And I went, I don't know, my love. I, it, I never get the duvet. And to me, this is the message that I'm hearing loud and clear today, is that it's really about coverage, isn't it? And uh, it's, it's, it really is. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, just because there's a duvet doesn't mean everybody gets access to it. And so that's one of the things that I'm really hearing. He's going to kill me now for sharing that, but keep it quiet, yeah? Um, but I'm really hearing that loud and clear today and that um, the inequality is not just between countries but it's within um, within countries between it's geography isn't it it's between whether you are rural or urban um, so there are those divisions okay Charles is ready for us excellent let's take a moment Charles hello Charles Charles in Qatar Charles, no. uh, unmute yourself, please. You've got two minutes. Thank you. Or three minutes. Go for it. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead Charles. Charles. I've uh, unmuted myself. Can you hear me? No. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. You Hi. Great. So my point was on innovation the challenges in doing innovation. I've been involved in doing innovation here in Qatar with the government and also uh, with a lot of private enterprises. And, but we, we face difficulty in changing the existing system. So what I found out is that the ideas and the innovation aspects that uh, primarily the youth but also the more experienced people are coming up with having a difficulty of being implemented into the uh, existing systems. So what we've done here is we've provided uh, focus groups, uh, innovation hubs here in Qatar. But we've also extended that out to include uh, areas outside of the state of Qatar and to bring in global resources in here to assist us. And the example I've given once before is there is a lot of uh, very well educated but underutilized uh, people in the region and areas such as Lebanon and Jordan that are well educated. 
but they have uh, little opportunities perhaps to get into the market. So by bringing them together with uh, existing uh, corporations and uh, research elements and more of a global push, it, it uh, goes against the uh, flow of all the ideas in IT and technology flow towards Silicon Valley, whereas we've got the ideas and we actually have resources and we have finance and we have government supporting across the region and so that we can do these aspects within the region. The other challenge that we've had is actually in implementing these ideas. So even when we have an idea to actually implement, maybe the government regulation takes 12 months to get through the regulatory process if it's a FinTech or a banking sort of type process. And then we also have uh, the operational aspects of large organisations such as telcos, aviation sector, airlines, they're very much uh, operational focused and they're used to doing the same sort of thing day to day and it's very difficult to actually be able to change, mm. uh, if you like, the engine on the aircraft while it's in flight. So what we're finding is actually working is, uh, is what Gartner, the Gartner Research Group calls the bimodal model, where we run it in parallel under the umbrella of the organisation, but not under the weight of the whole organisation. So if you're right. trying to do an organ, uh, a change or an innovation in a telco sector, you know, two million uh, subscribers and day-to-day -day business, it's very difficult to do when you're trying to carry the weight of that entire business. So if you can do it alongside it in a local and more regional focused uh, manner, that's one of the other challenges. But uh, what we are finding is that we really need to get people together globally. Yeah. We need to create our own virtual, regional and global hubs here. Uh, across the region and across the world and bring the people together. It's, as long as we can bring them all together, they don't have to be sitting in the same country and we can actually help people assist in resolving problems in their own countries and where innovations are actually coming out of the developing world, which are actually more innovative and, and really outcomes focused rather than uh, what we're seeing in some of the developed world. We don't have to follow the developed world uh, to actually get the outcomes that we require. Right, thank you, Charles. Please stay online with us for the questions. We'd love your input, okay? Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, um, we are gonna take some questions now um, and we would really love your input. So please, don't be shy. We really love to hear what you've got to say and, ask you, and answer your questions. I was quite particularly taken by what Charles said. We yeah. don't have to follow the developed world, mm. and innovation is coming from the developing world. So that's from uh, the perspective from Qatar. So with that, please, people, the mic is here. <laughs> I can't believe nobody wants to talk at an IGF, and it's only day zero. <laughs> Come, please. And while he's here, others who want to speak after him, just please make your way. Don't be shy. Own it. This is your meeting. It's not just the panelists. It's yours. Hello, uh, my name is Thiago Novaes. I'm a Brazilian researcher. Okay. Uh, I come from a country where we have less than our 200 million population connected to the internet. Mm. And particularly in the Amazon, we have a lot of problems with electricity. So I was really interested in this panel. So my question would be for all of you. I heard some of you belong to Ministry of Education. And, uh, and uh, when I hear access, Sometimes I feel like, uh, well, let's provide access, let's work with community networks, but then what's the role of education mm. in providing this access? Because we know sometimes huge enterprises are capable of offering connectivity, yeah. but uh, then people then become part of this. Some, in some, some place they don't even know what internet is. Right, correct. <laughs> because yeah. it's uh, just a few websites that are allowed to connect. Yes. So what's the role of education in providing connectivity? Thank you, an excellent question. Ines, it's, you've, it's, got, it's got your name on it. 
<laughs> we'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is this working? Hey. It's working? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, so I work for the Ministry of Education, but um, not as, uh, in, as a teacher, actually. Um, so we've worked uh, on some partnerships with, uh, for example, the British Council uh, to provide more education and training for teachers and for students. And uh, also last year, um, for example, at my school, uh, we have invited uh, the Internet Society uh, chapter of Tunisia to provide more education uh, to the, our uh, students on um, their privacy, uh, uh, security, online security, and those things. Uh, in terms of education, um, I think um, this is very important, uh, but it needs infrastructure mm. and it needs uh, some money. It needs funds. So, uh, for example, I, I teach at a remote countryside area. There is electricity, but the electricity is not very stable. Um, there is internet sometimes, but it is not stable either. Um, so I think that the government has to really put this on the table. Uh, the parliaments, not only in Tunisia, but um, in all developing countries, uh, they have to put this on the table and to put the funds, the necessary funds, because I believe, uh, and I think most of the people believe, that education is the one, the first really pillar on any country's development. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. I just thought it was interesting what you were saying earlier, Ines, about um, the risk of technology being the replacement for jobs in the future. And I just wonder how you would teach and train and communicate and empower um, a whole generation of children if there was no expectation for work beyond that. So uh, I just find that very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay, next question. Uh, yes, Adrian. Adrian Gardner, I'm a former uh, US federal uh, executive, and my last stint was I was the chief information officer for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Mm. And I did a lot of work in uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin sure. Islands, and so I have a, the, 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 the uh, islands have a special place in my heart. Um, my question is around continuity planning, because although we have um, potentially good coverage as far as electricity, spotty coverage as far as communication in some of these rural areas. We also need to think about continuity in general. So my question is, what are you doing around continuity and not only continuity within your own country, your own island, mm. but around the islands and countries around you? Excellent question. Um, panel, if we could be brief of our answers, I'd appreciate it because time is against us. Thank you. Excellent question. Yeah, sure, one more, of course. Okay, yes, Jackson. Oh, take the other question. Take the other question first, sorry. Yeah. Oh, actually, I have comments. So. Oh, please, yeah. Okay, S thank you very much for interesting conversation. I am Ramune Patuhovaiti. I work for international organization called... Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's only day one. <laughs> electronic, <laughs> yeah, electronic information for libraries. Okay. So I'm really very glad to hear uh, GIFIC um, presentation mm. here because they supported public libraries uh, with mm, internet right. and, and access. And I would draw attention to all developing countries uh, that public libraries and community libraries are based in community and if they are connected, they can serve a lot of things, right. including also providing digital skills training for, for people in some places, they also serve as second responders mm. in natural disasters situations and so on. So I, I, I would like really to draw attention to public libraries. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Jackson, please feel free to answer. Yes, uh, thank you. I uh, answer the uh, part of the first question and the other one on continuity planning. Mm. Um, Education plays a very important role in terms of uh, access to uh, information uh, for our country in uh, Vanuatu. Our universal access programs are targeted at schools. Uh, firstly, uh, schools are a neutral crown. Uh, they are a common crown where uh, communities, uh, people from different uh, religious backgrounds, they uh, come together 
uh, at schools, and we believe schools uh, play an important part in uh, the change that you actually want in uh, communities. And the uh, second part on uh, continuity planning, uh, Vanuatu, as you know, is ranked first in the world as the most uh, vulnerable country to any form of uh, natural disaster. And as mm -hmm. we speak, we have a category three cyclone yeah. uh, forming around there. So uh, in terms of uh, continuity planning, we do have hubs uh, around the Pacific where a uh, community of uh, operators uh, store uh, backup equipment and are deployed uh, with support from uh, ITU uh, and some of you in this room uh, to help us uh, in the yeah. event of a disaster. So we do have those plans. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sorry my, to cut you short, Jackson. Sorry. My apologies because we're running out of time. Yeah. If we could just take the last comment from Alejandro Absolutely. Thank from you. Mexico. Lovely. And if we can ask back to wrap up the Absolutely. session and thank, thank the you. panelists. Thank you for your patience. Thanks. Thank you. Alejandro Pisanti from the National University of Mexico. I work at the School of Chemistry and I have been the CIO of the university. So I'm bringing chemistry and computing together and the internet. So question, uh, do you have any examples where the scaling properties of your access, internet access solution parallels the scaling properties of your electricity providing solution? Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, would anybody like to answer that? Just before the panel un answers that, I'll just uh, pose um, uh, just in relation to what he asked. The stats that were before you in terms of the electricity penetration rate were sourced from the World Bank, the report that was yeah. published in May. The internet penetration rate was actually sourced from uh, APNIX uh, Chief uh, Scientist Jeff Houston's uh, Potteroo site. But uh, in relation to your question, could you please uh, clarify for Zena to answer, please? <laughs> yes, thank you. The, what I'm asking is whether, if you're looking especially at forward-looking technologies for electricity generation, like photovoltaics or uh, what's now called artificial photosynthesis, uh, electro, new electrochemistry, or whether you're using uh, small gas uh, generators, etc., do any of those scale in parallel to what you need for access? thinking of pricing, but also thinking of the technical expertise you have to put in the field. You put in a student from an engineering school, uh, if he's an electronics guy, he maybe doesn't know how to generate electricity mm. and vice versa. And okay. you lose them. So that's the question. Great, thank you. Um, I'll I, I, think, I think what I can, the, the closest I can come to answering your question is what happens in Ghana. We have a grid company called Gridco, which handles the national grid. Now, the law that set up Gridco also allows them to act as an ISP. So basically, what you're looking to do is that when they build their connectivity to send electricity across the country, they can also carry capacity in terms of data connectivity alongside. So then you have a utility service that is not just supplying electricity, but also being able to carry power and uh, uh, data connectivity. And what you have then is you can have a trade-off between areas where Gridco has capacity or has lines and doesn't have capacity, and then a telco and MNO has capacity, mm. you can do trade-offs and swaps. So those are the things that we're looking to do in Ghana, Excellent. where you can marry connectivity and electricity. Thank you. Thank you, panel. We appreciate your time today, and I hope you found that useful. Um, remember, it's about coverage, and uh, you can't find poverty without electricity. You can't deal with anything without it. So let's bear that in mind as we build. Okay, thank you. And just for your information, uh, there's a live document that's going to be published online where all this conversation will continue generically and we look to harvest the document before Friday. So that's going to be published on uh, two sites and it'll be tweeted. So please follow us on Twitter. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. So with that, that's a wrap. Apologies to the next uh, session. No, all right. uh, anyone who's here? Oh, no. oh. Please do stay for the next session. We're going to be talking about the Convention of the Rights of the Child and its relevance to the digital world.